because a lot of these guys showed up from other places to court Penelope. Then, in a long morning file, they moved to assembly where once they grouped crowding the meeting grounds, so one more time, we're back at the meeting grounds, just like at the beginning of, of, the, of this poem. Are, um, the old lord Eupithes rose in their midst to speak out. Eupithes, the father of Antinous. Unforgettable sorrow wrung his heart for his son, Antinous, the first that great Odysseus killed. In tears for the one he lost, he stood and cried, My friends, what a mortal blow this man has dealt to all our island people. Those fighters, many and brave, he, Odysseus, led away in his curved ships. He lost the ships, and he lost the men, and back he comes again to kill the best of our princes. Quick, after him, before he flees to Pylos. In other words, we gotta, we, we gotta kill him. He, he continues, We'll hang our heads forever, all disgraced, even by generations down the years, if we don't punish the murderers, later we'll call them assassins, of our brothers and our sons. Why, life would lose its relish, for me at least. I'd rather die at once and go among the dead, which is exactly what's going to happen in a little bit, because Laertes is going to jack him. Attack before the assassins cross the sea and leave us in their way. Well, this is a suggestion. Medon, the herald, shows up along with the poet who has been released by Odysseus, and uh, they will give the caution, don't fight Odysseus. Um, Halithesis, uh, one of the uh, uh, master's sons, uh, one who, who knows well, an old man says, yeah, you, you, this is bad news, you shouldn't do this. And he says it at line 503, hear me, men of Ithaca, thanks to your own craven hearts these things were done. In other words, sounding very much like Zeus at the beginning of the Odyssey, Halothesis will say, the reason this happened to all of these guys is because of you. This isn't Zeus's fault, it's because you did not take care of your business. You never listened to me, or the good commander mentor. You never put a stop to your son's senseless folly. What fine work they did, so blind, so reckless, back to that notion of sight. Car carving away the wealth, affronting the wife of a great and famous man, telling themselves he'd never return no more. Um, that, they, that he'd return no more. That idea, again, that they told themselves stories that ultimately were false. So let things rest now. Listen to me for once. I say, don't attack. Eupithes will win the day, however, with his argument, and they will go off to fight against Odysseus. Meanwhile, for the last time, we have Athena with Zeus. And notice how many times we have said, for the last time, happening in book 24. It is a beautiful culmination book of the Homeric Iliad Odyssey poems, right? Athena will speak to Zeus and say, what secrets are hidden in your mind? Zeus will come back and say, why do you prime and probe me so intently at, at, uh, to, um, uh, at 528? She, he says, come now, wasn't the plan your own? You conceived it yourself. He said this several times to Athena. Odysseus should return, pay the traitors back. Do as your heart desires. He said the same thing to Poseidon about the Phaeacians, didn't he? But let me tell you how it should be done. Now the royal Odysseus has taken his revenge. Let both sides seal their packs that he shall reign for life. And let us purge their memories of the bloody slaughter of their brothers and their sons. Let them be friends, devoted as in the old days live. Uh, let peace and wealth come cresting through the land. In other words, Zeus says, I don't want any more fighting. I want everybody to be friends and get along. Well, conflict resolution, we have learned in our study of the Iliad and the Odyssey, it's not so easily attained, is it, right? And so here at the end, we're going to get this kind of bizarre Hollywood-like ending where everything's going to be smiles and rosy because Athena's going to will it to be so. Which does beg the question, can you have conflict resolution without some belief in gods? That is to say, some kind of instantiation that if you break the pact, you're, you know, you're, you're going to end up being punished by the gods. It's an interesting question. Odysseus will ask uh, what's going on, and sure enough, they all show up. Uh, even Dolius and Laertes, the old men, will armor up for their um, um, uh, Aristia, that, that term we, we introduced in our study of the Iliad. And then as mentor, Athena will show up, and as soon as mentor shows up, Odysseus is ready to point out to his son at, at, at 560 or so, Telemachus, he says to his boy, you'll, so, you'll soon learn enough as you move up to fight where champions strive to prove themselves the best. In other words, you haven't proved yet everything about being a man. Not to disgrace your father's line a moment. In other words, don't disgrace me, boy. In battle prowess, we've excelled for ages all across the world. In other words, you better be able to stand up with Laertes and with your father and show your battle prowess. Telemachus will reassure him. 
going back to the opening lines in, 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 in Iliad, um, in, in Odyssey 1, when uh, Athena tells Telemachus it's time to grow up at 341, he says, now, Telemachus says, you'll see if you care to watch, Father. Now I'm fired up. Disgrace, you say? I won't disgrace your line. And where Laertes calls out in deep delight, what a day for me, dear gods. Think about how the day began for Laertes in a, in a field distraught and how it's going to end. What joy, my son and my grandson, vying over courage. Laertes, Athena will then say, dearest of all my comrades, she of course was told by Zeus, I want, I want peace. But Athena can't seem to let it go. She says, say a prayer to the bright-eyed girl and Father Zeus, then brandish your long spear and wing it fast. Throw that spear. Let's see what happens. So, reminding us that, of course, Hera played the same game in the Iliad, which we thought that the war was going to be over, and then, of course, it was back on. Athena breathed enormous strength into the old man. He lifted a prayer to mighty Zeus's daughter, brandished his spear in a moment, winged it fast. He hit Eupithes, pierced his bronze-sided helmet. That failed to block the bronze spear point, tearing through. Down Eupithes crashed his armor clanging against his chest. This is, of course, the language directly of the Iliad. The poet is clearly, at the end of the poem, wanting to bring us back to the Iliad one last time. We're then told Odysseus and his galleon son charged straight at the front lines, slashing away with swords with two-edged spears, and now they would have killed them all at 581. Cut them off from home if Athena, daughter of Stormy Zeus, had not cried out in a piercing voice and stopped all fighters cold. Hold back, you men of Ithaca back from brutal war, break off, shed no more blood, make peace at once. So Athena commanded. Terror blanched their faces. They went limp with fear. Weapons slipped from their hands and strewed the ground at the, at the goddess's ringing voice. They spun in flight to the city, wild to save their lives. But, loosing a savage cry, we're back to the Iliad and the famous cries and screams of the Iliad, right? We commented on it a number of times. The long-enduring great Odysseus, line 590, gathering all his force, swooped like a soaring eagle. How many times have we seen the eagle references? And of course, in Penelope's dream, Odysseus is in fact the eagle killing all those geese, right? Like a soaring eagle, just as the son of Kronos hurled a reeking bolt that fell at her feet, the mighty fa uh, father's daughter. Uh, it's almost like Athena is going to let Odysseus go ahead and jack all these other guys. And blazing-eyed Athena, wheeling on Odysseus, cried out, royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, master of exploits, Hold back now. Call a halt to the great level or war. That great level or war is a direct uh, line from the Iliad we saw many times, wasn't it? Don't court the rage of Zeus who rules the world. In other words, knock it off. Which is, of course, very similar to the language that was given to Achilles about returning the body of Hector to Priam. So we've got all of these amazing circles that are coming back in this final book. So she commanded. He obeyed her. Glad at heart, very much similar to what Achilles will decide to do with, with Hector glad at heart. And Athena handed down her packs of peace between both sides for all the years to come. The daughter of Zeus, whose shield is storm and thunder, yes, but the goddess still kept mentors, build, and voice. It's fascinating then that the last word of our poem is the word voice, and of course, this has been a poem of voices that are telling stories. All right, let's finish now quickly at levels two and three. Well, so much could be said. Let's try and focus just a few messages here at 2A. Everything, as we said, comes full circle. We begin with Athena and Zeus. Obviously, we end with Athena and Zeus. We begin, notice this, in the Iliad, we begin with a father requesting his daughter in Trisius back, right, the, the uh, priest of Apollo. We end the Iliad with a father, Priam, asking for Hector back. We, at the end of the Odyssey, have a father and a son who are reunited in Odysseus and Laertes, and a father and son who are only reunited in the house of death in, um, in Eupithes and Antinous. Another major message is that children, especially sons in, the, in our poem, remember what fathers give them. Odysseus remembers the thing about the trees, and the father, of course, immediately recognizes that you really are my son. Finally, we have to say this, in a patriarchy, women are always the ones to be blamed. Helen, Clytemnestra, Penelope, on and on it goes, are the reason why terrible things happen. Put a note to yourself at, at uh, 3A that when we meet Chaucer's wife of Bath, she's going to make that argument as she talks about the fact that in the biblical text, it will be Eve who gets blamed for all of the bad stuff of the world, and the wife of Bath will point out you know, men are the ones who 
tell that story, wrote that story, tell that story. Let a woman tell the story. Let Eve tell the story, and I guarantee you she says it'll have been a lot different. When we get to the prologue of, of the wife of Bath, we'll, we'll enjoy that one. For our last time with the Odyssey, let's play level 2B. And the symbolism, of course, the Odyssey itself is the great symbol, no question. That is to say the journeys, the circles. We have even greater numbers of, of journeys happening, obviously, in the final book. Think about the ways in which Laertes, Odysseus, and Telemachus are representative and symbolic of the generations as well that have been so important in the stories of Homer. You come from somewhere and from someone, right? Don't screw up the lineage is what Odysseus is saying to Telemachus at the end. Of course, the trees of Laertes also are a powerful symbol. Those deep roots that are still growing now 20 years later, you know, even more than that because Telemachus, Odysseus was a little boy when he got them. The irony, I mean, there's so many that we could point out with here, but the irony of all ironies is that the only way peace happens is when Athena comes down out of the sky and says, enough. Finally, at 3A, well, we've said it already. In Iliad 24, we notice we have no funeral for Achilles, but it happens here. Fascinating, the way we come back to it. Well, which one is your favorite ending? Now we'll finish. The Iliad or the Odyssey? And uh, what is your favorite ending in a movie uh, or a video game for you that somehow is reminiscent? Finally, at, three, at 3B to finish. Well, there it is. What are your impressions? Jot those down. Let me ask this question, though, as we finish. The Homeric tradition. What kind of a civilization would we see formed if it began with two stories called the Iliad and the Odyssey? Hmm. Some of you will immediately say, well, a lot of sex and violence. True. A lot will say a love of family, a love of storytelling that will attend that family. Some of you will say, well, if you're going to talk about a patriarchy, there's going to be a lot of blame that's got to go around, and blaming women in the end will probably be the easiest. Well, that's our Homer study. Now we're going to turn to the last of the three really important Greco-Roman epics, the Roman epic poem Virgil's Aeneid. We're going to see how Virgil will use the Iliad and the Odyssey and extend beyond it, Define the great Roman people and set us up for our study of Dante's Inferno later. I hope that you've enjoyed this study of Homer as much as have I. Thank you very much.